Park. Bruce, you're going to give me the tour, correct? I'm, I'm going to give you a tour oh, excellent. Uh, of uh, this exhibition at uh, the Mississippi Museum of Art. Right here, we're in front of Marie Hall's own self-portrait, uh, and it's a pastel on paper, quite beautiful. It's one of her earlier pieces, it's too, because she's about 20 when she did that. It's, it's very uh, early, and I think uh, quite quite beautiful, the hopeful look in her eye, yes. her expectation of the future. And it's done a little later. This was a woodblock, and it's thought to be of Marie Hall, and uh, I think quite fun yeah. and wonderful. And when she was studying at, at the Pennsylvania Academy of Art, uh, she made drawings and studies like these mm -hmm. and trying to learn anatomy and how to paint figures. These are obviously not uh, as skilled as she would later. Right. Uh, but you get a real taste for her talent and where she's going to go. Uh, and the thing I enjoy too, I mean, she's so famous for oil paintings, but to have in the collection some of her work on paper and her charcoal and pastels really adds an extra layer. I to think it. that's right, and it shows the growth that yeah. would take place, which yeah. is tremendous. And then in the 1920s, she, she came here, let me show you, uh, to Florida. She loved to travel, and she loved nature and wildlife, so she saw, I think for the first time, these flamingos, and she then also uh, bought magazines of wildlife, so making uh, drawings and sketches. She, she studied uh, this quite a bit. It's not just uh, taken from nature. Uh, but photographs, but I, I think uh, extraordinary work, and you kind of get a playful Art Nouveau period from the 20s also, and here an example of the sketches she did, uh, studying. Here we have the great blue herons. This is one of her great works from that period. This has a great story to it, too, because this, this painting was thought to be lost. Yeah, this was uh, thought to be lost. Uh, when Malcolm Norwood and his colleagues wrote uh, The Art of Marie Hull, they wrote, thought to be lost, and my mother's bridge partner called me and said, I think I know where that painting is, and gave me the number of a wonderful collector, and so we found it in Arkansas, and it belongs to a wonderful family. Okay, that was truly one of the most Mississippi moments there. Totally Mississippi. My mother's bridge partner knew. That's right. Oh, that's great. And she was a wonderful lady. But you can see early on her grasp of color and, and her gift. I mean, it's just a absolutely yeah. right there. You, you you get the genius yeah. uh, is there, and in a work like this, this is the one of her uh, great uh, paintings from that period as well. And you see the impasto, the way she makes the strokes. It's quite uh, lavish and beautiful, and I, I think one of her really successful paintings of the period. So then she won an award uh, that allowed her to go and study in Europe. And here we have some, if you can see here, we have uh, beautiful works uh, from Spain. Here she's in Cuenca. And uh, this is one of her great oil paintings. And she had never seen architecture like this. And this also shows a kind of uh, forward-looking thinking about painting. She's, uh, it's almost cubistic, if mm -hmm. you will. And, uh, and the, the, here, this is a study, oh, wow. which I, I love. And so you have the study, and then you have the actual painting itself. And it's, it's a marvelous work, uh, and it's particularly fascinating how this just fades into kind of shadow and color. And, and she was already playing with abstraction. Yeah, there's a little bit of an impressionistic look about that, it. That's, you know, that, very that, early, too. That's correct. And so each of these it takes you through different places. Here, uh, she's in Cord in France. Oh, wow. And this is a beautiful painting, as you see. Uh, and the use of color is remarkable. So many different colors. And, uh, and here she's signing Marie A. Hall. And uh, her maiden name was Atkinson. And so this is extraordinary that you watch this evolution of her work. This uh, oh, was no. the lady who owned the home where she stayed uh, when she was there. And uh, I've always thought this was uh, a just 
kind of a romantic, beautiful painting, but evidently she didn't like this woman very much oh, really? and found her a little disturbing. And uh, But I, I think it's a terrific painting. Well, that was so beautiful about her portraits because there was so much of, uh, you got a sense of the period of, and she didn't just do glamorous people, she did everyday no, people. No, she painted, she really painted what she saw. She, yeah. she was a very truthful painter. Oh, yeah. so, again, a different view of uh, the Barbican. Uh, this is the great fortress, and she did a beautiful oil of this. Here now, a change of light, and suddenly you're in Sancerre. This is a wonderful piece. Uh, the watercolor, uh, you can just feel a different... Is there anything she could not do? I mean, if she can handle watercolors that well, she just she, seemed to have She a was a natural virtuoso painter. I yeah. mean, this she just had. She, un she had a great hand, uh, I think, uh, great facility uh, with her brushes. And, uh, and she was a very fast painter. She painted very quickly. Yeah. These were done just quickly in the morning or afternoon, and she would go out in different locations. A uh, little drawing of uh, here, also from Sasseo. Wonderful piece. Here's an extraordinary piece. You see the, look at the marvelous use of color. Oh, yeah. It, it, it gives it so much depth. Oh, much nice. depth and an extraordinary willingness to let certain details go to bring out uh, you know, depth and uh, design. It's a powerful piece, I think. And by using light, she just allows certain elements to pop. Correct, yeah. correct. Here are the Chateau and Uzerche. Wonderful. And again, you see the, the use of strokes and, and, and palette. It's, it's a fascinating work. Well, your book is incredible, Bright Fields, The Mastery of Marie Hall, and of course there's nearly over 200 pieces in this in this book. It's Thank great, but to be able to come here and see it in person, to see how she applied the oil and to see the strokes, you truly, you see this and you're thinking this is gorgeous, this is beautiful. Thank you. You look at this up close and you see, you can Thank see you. her genius. Well, I think uh, we were very fortunate in that. And you capture a lot of that. The reproductions there. ended up being in pieces like this, yeah. that, not in the exhibit, but there, I, I think we uh, managed to... You hit, did, you captured Here you it. have this, yeah. uh, and hopefully we capture some of it. And, and then if you, if you, thank you. Sure. If, here, this is a wonderful study uh, of Yuserish, and it, it may seem at first glance a somber little painting, mm -hmm. but it's... A, Actually, yeah. quite. Uh, it's brilliant, and it's uh, brilliant. Work. And it's so different than the styles that she was using up to. Them. Yes, yes, and and if you come close, you can really see the strokes. Yeah. Extraordinary. Her brushwork. And again, almost cubism. Almost. Yeah. And uh, Picasso at this time was exploring cubism and had done the reservoir, yeah. which is very similar to this, and she may well have seen it when, when she painted this. She uh, uh, went to uh, all the great museums in Europe at that time. The travel truly paid off for her. Yeah, it did pay yeah, off, it know. did. You can see the maturity in her work grow as she traveled, and, and travel back then wasn't as easy as it is today. We think about, oh, we'll just hop on a plane and go to Paris. No. No, that's no. right. Here, she's in Morocco, and what's interesting to me is just not only uh, the obvious architectural differences one sees, but the color change right. that uh, it obviously it seemed, uh, caught the culture. the culture. And she had such a marvelous internal eye, a psychological eye for what she was saying. And so I think this is a wonderful piece, marvelous. All right, so then uh, before we get to the 30s, we just did a little. Uh, period where we go through her floral works because this is how she made a living uh, through much of her career. Uh, people were not always buying complicated works. They, would, they wanted beautiful flowers. And so here she's painting uh, these fantastic uh, works and did them very well. Uh, this, she was very proud of this. Uh, I, I think this is very much uh, a, a kind of impressionistic period. I was uh, thinking Monet when I first uh, saw of it. Of course, or, or even Casada could yeah. be. It's, it's uh, uh, exquisite uh, brushwork and design, and uh, it shows the Japanois influence that was very popular in France, the period. And 
uh, I think, uh, quite beautiful. This is a lovely work, early, early work from 1920, and yet you see the uh, remarkable brushwork, e even in 1920. And so then, as we progress, we see her changing a little bit, but she studied the anatomy just as she did of human figures of each different flower, and I, I think painted with uh, just remarkable persuasion these works. Then magnolias were very popular, and so uh, of course she mastered the magnolia. That was yeah. that was her bread and butter uh, as far as income goes. I've noticed her brush work is tighter in these these paintings than the, in some of her previous ones. It's like she's. It's, the, the earlier work is certainly tighter uh, in, in this period. It's interesting. I think she uh, was looser uh, in the 20s. Yeah. And then she's somehow, yes, trying to, uh, I think, be more realistic and exact in the, yeah. the, in the 30s. Realism was in. And, and here, this is, a, I think, a staggering uh, early work. Uh, wow. It's called Magnolia Blossoms. And one, one of the more complicated pieces. And, lot going on there, right. and uh, it, very well done. Here, this is much later, uh, and now she's it's loosened back she's up. Lo she's loosened back up, and she's uh, playing. And now you see she's become Marie very well known. So she leaves the A out, and it's just Marie Hall. I've, I've noticed her signature changing throughout the painting. That's that's right. But these it, the, this vertical stroke yeah. is is characteristic of her, and. Uh, I also love that she captures the dying magnolia. There's that, 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 something quite beautiful and touching about that. So I see already mid fifties. This is beautiful, uh, uh, very Luke's work. The mom's. Uh, the, I mean, the, the detail in that is remarkable. And uh, get, once again, you get the vertical strokes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and and it, it feels certainly the, the feel of impressionism mm -hmm. here. The, Another fantastic Japanese irises, mm -hmm. uh, quite beautiful. Uh, this, oh, wow. this is an extraordinary work. It was given to a family who had supported uh, the museum. Uh, it was a special commission uh, from uh, the trustees, uh, Mrs. Hall, and so she clearly put a lot of work into it. But if you get very close up to each individual flower, if you'll see how many different colors mm -hmm. just in one it's extraordinary. She's, as it's been pointed out, she uses the same value for each color. So when you stand back, you, you, it doesn't appear that each one has as many colors. But this, this makes them come alive and uh, come so vibrant. Yeah. It's extraordinary. Probably explodes. Just it, it explodes. Really does. That's that's correct. And I, I think this is one of her greatest florals. Oh, no the doubt. spider lilies. There's a yeah. there's a play and and a joy to it. Uh, she's in now. This is 1967. You can she's, tell she's very comfortable with uh, what, what part she is in life. She's in, she's in full control of every element, uh, uh, certainly of the color, but uh, also she's just let go and uh, she's playful with her own uh, sense of color, uh, but it, it's just a completely great and successful work. Beautiful. And these are other yeah. beautiful pieces from those periods. And now we're going to go back in time a little bit. Uh, first, let me say, these are, she also would paint certain figures uh, in the community. And these are little boys. These happen to be the Creek Moors, uh, the Creek Moors yes. uh, that, that owned C Spire uh, when they were very young. Oh, wow. uh, they, at that time, they didn't have uh, C Spire, but they were, they were just uh, sweet little boys. And this is Wade, and this is Jimmy. And Jimmy told me that when she finished the painting, she turned to him and said, with or without? And he said, with or without what? And she said, freckles. And of course, because he had freckles, and so his mother quickly said, no freckles. Oh, wow. And so Jimmy had red hair and obviously must have had a few freckles then. Uh, and I think these are just delightful. What a wonderful piece of history. On piece of Jackson yeah, history. Yeah, that's great. Exactly. But these oh. are important pieces from the 1930s. And if you first start here, uh, even before, in 1928, she painted Annie Smith. And Annie Smith worked for the Hulls, and 
she was very strict with them. She would never let Mr. or Mrs. Hull play cards or the radio on Sunday. <laughs> but I think it's one of her finest works. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just very powerful and very dignified. dignified. And, yes, but also the period of the 20s, you see the explosion of color, everything. It was a different era. And mm -hmm. then suddenly in the 20s when she came back from Europe, she paints this in 1930. And this is a great painting. It's Melissa. And straight on, this figure, Melissa also uh, had worked with them. And I find this to be uh, one of her great, beautiful early works there. She's telling stories about people who may not have ever had their story told. We might have lost what And there's a, there, there's a lot to be told in that phase. Oh, there's incredible. What, how yeah. much life she has seen. That's, that's correct. And as we know, this was, a, captured it perfectly. this was a difficult period for African Americans. Uh, and it was a difficult period in the Depression for all Americans. But uh, certainly uh, for African Americans in that period, I think, uh, uh, particularly difficult. And... Uh, and yet she paints this uh, figure uh, not uh, doing something uh, uh, menial, but just in this beautiful, dignified way, and I find it very powerful. And there's the, the, sketch. the sketch for it. And then here, this was entered into a national watercolor show. This is, this is Mandy, and I, this is one of the yeah. superb works. It's a mixture of all kinds of things, watercolor and graphite, I think. And, but, uh, just just incredible. And the fact that she's painting figures face on, yeah. very important. Uh, you catch so much emotion when you can look right in their eyes and see their soul. That's right. And now the Sharecropper, the Sharecropper series. So some of these figures uh, from the countryside would come in mm -hmm. and would look for work because there was, uh, they were either losing their farms or couldn't make it go. And so she would sometimes give people uh, a, a small amount of money, but say, would you mind sitting for me a little bit? Yeah. And so they would sit for it. And they, they would be in her home, but she actually then painted this in her mind. She, she set them in this area. Uh, and uh, this is a very beautiful piece. Uh, and, and this is Henry Louis Gregor. His uh, granddaughter contacted me looking for this portrait. That, oh, wow. Yes, and I, I knew where it was. And I arranged for the family to actually see the portrait again. And his daughter is still alive and dictated a passage that appears in the book about her own father. And his arrangement was he agreed. He very, it's called tenant farmer, but mm -hmm. he absolutely uh, said he was not a tenant farmer uh, and you, always was beautifully dressed when he went into town. Mm -hmm. But she put him in the overalls because she wanted to. But she loved his face, and he agreed to sit if she would give his daughter art lessons. Really? And so it was a marvelous uh, trade, and yeah. it also showed. And she indeed became a painter. But it it showed that he was trying to do something for his family yeah. during this period. This was a way to. Uh, he, he swallowed his pride a little bit for some, the first kids. So, somewhat, and yeah. uh, that's correct. That's awesome. And. Uh, his daughter, Mrs. Hull, loved dogs and always had um, a dog or two in her home. And uh, when the granddaughter told me that uh, Mr. Gregard's daughter was recollecting the dogs, I thought, well, this is going to be great. She's going to talk about how cute the dogs were in it. And when finally I read the passage, she came and she said, yes, Mrs. Hull had two dogs. I hated those dogs. <laughs> Uh, every time I went for the turpentine rags, they would nip at me. And so uh, it, it's funny what the, the real story is behind these, but I think this is a great piece. And then she put these two together in this remarkable oh, sure. painting, and it's called Sharecroppers. Yeah. And I think it, it's a kind of experiment. And uh, they obviously really weren't sitting together, and yet somehow this, this painting works. It's, it's very powerful, and uh, it's part of the... 1930s realism period, and we saw that the ash can period, and I find this uh, moving, and the hands, if you can get up close to see, the hands are extraordinary.
and which I can tell you as an artist is one of the most difficult things to master yes. on the body. And, and the, 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 the amount of color yeah. that she uses in these faces. And there's something real and yet unreal about them and, and the entire composition, but I, I think it's one of her great works, of course. These are scenes from the countryside of the period from 1931. This is Laundry Day, and it's a common scene. Yeah. We saw this even growing up, I saw that. This is towards the end of the Depression, and this is the Eggman. By 1939, the palette's changed a little bit. Things are starting to look up. And even his face, there's, there's almost a sense of resignation that's, I think, kind of nice and yeah. uh, uh, reassuring. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. More scenes that were common, I think, in her day to see families uh, in the countryside. It's not just a landscape, you, you catch the people in there too. Catch it gives, people. It gives it an extra layer of depth. There's even a dog right here. Yeah. And it's, yes, this, it's, it's a piece of our history. And, and, uh, but to be able to, to go from this piece to this piece, to, to bounce around in styles and be able to master every style she does yes. so well. Yes, right. If you see here, the, yeah, you the, get a feel. The, the, the yeah. feel of the, the, the countryside and uh, the, the modest circumstances yeah. that people were living under. It's a, uh, more of these, uh, one more chair copper, which I find very powerful. This is 1937, and you see his face still, the, the pain in that face, yeah. I think, is compelling. You can tell the trauma he has been through. Exactly. There's almost, almost like a blank stare, like a soldier that's been in combat. Of course, of course. And so this is a, uh, a remarkable brushwork and use of color. Uh, and, and once again, the hands. The they hands, tell the story. The hands are extraordinary. And, uh, but it is, again, uh, she was painted in her kitchen, hence the tablecloth that appears again and again in yeah. her works. But she's setting out, this, is, this landscape in a way is a landscape in his mind, yeah. I think. It's a marvelous work. Uh, this was of the period uh, outside of her home. Uh, Mr. Hall designed this house and, of course, her, Mrs. Hall's own house. And it's just a little snapshot. And of, you can drive by that house today. You can drive by the house today. It looks like a nice, cool, rainy day. Um, it's almost in the it, winter. It you does. Can, it, uh, exactly. Well, your, your, your wonderful eye notices the leafless yeah. tree, right? Uh, this... This is wonderful. This piece, uh, what I thought was lost, uh, it was only found just before the book was published. We managed to get it in there. This is Solomon Gross. And on the back, it's extraordinary. Uh, at the top, it, it says, the old slave. At the bottom, she wrote, because he was born into slavery. But at, at the bottom, it says, American. Nice. And this, this is a beginning of something that uh, would lead to the American citizen, but I, I actually think this is one of her very best paintings ever. Uh, again, the hands and the, and the way this gentleman is sitting with such dignity and that face uh, says things that... Uh, you just think uh, of the life that he's lived describe. and what he's seen. Yeah. Yes, that's right. See, he has seen much. And the, the unusual way that she paints around him, rather than the countryside, this, this is just uh, a marvelous, uh, to, to me actually, they look of uh, the cotton ball that has already been cut, you know, it's the, the hull there. Um, this is another one of the sharecroppers, it's a rather iconic one of the tenant farmer, uh, that rugged face, uh, the hand, uh, the, the, the neckline, the shadow on his face. Singer Jason Ipsel has a line in one of his songs called Sheercropper Eyes. Mm. That explains it to me right there. Yeah, exactly what Sheercropper Eyes. Yeah. A, a, a doleful sadness yeah. there. Very, very powerful. This is the great painting, The American Citizen. And, and I think if you can get yeah. just face on to, to see his, his, the eyes and the, the marvelous presentation of this very simple, direct, powerful portrait, and 
yet not so simple at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> she, his, his cuffs are unbuttoned, the tie just slightly loosened. Uh, just a he's got a little bit of a slump. Just he's yes, sitting. he's he's at at 94 years old here. Uh, a, a remarkable life that he's led. I'll be lucky if I'm this direction and not this direction yes. at 94. Yes. What a incredible and, piece. And 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 yet somehow this this look in his eye and the face it's a, a, almost as if he's watching her watch him. Yeah. It's a I think a very special piece, but not only because of the painting itself, but that she gave it the title, An American Citizen. It means uh, so much. And of course, you know, uh, I commissioned a piece of music uh, that somehow evokes this bitter sweetness that I think comes through in the painting in his face. It's, it's a lovely work. She uh, asked $500 for it. Even then, even then, which was a lot of money, you got to understand. That's I mean, that's right. She she knew that this was one she of knew her, it was special. It was a special work, and uh, we're very lucky to have it here in the museum. It's in the permanent collection, and this is uh, a, another painting of uh, John. It's called Sunday Afternoon, and this it's felt that uh, uh, this was done after. I'm, sometimes uh, that's not so. She mixed up dates yeah. and. Uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, it could have been, but it's interesting. She she paints the sharecropper scene, and yet he's in the beautiful suit, and uh, I think likely went to church. Yeah. And uh, I, I think a, another compelling and beautiful piece. Could, did you see it as well? It's yeah, a lovely. And here we have actual photographs of Mr. Washington. Oh, wow. Which I think are lovely. They are. All right. So now, after the 30s, she began to take more chances in her painting to explore other works. And one of her students, Andrew Bucci, a quite well-known painter in his own right, Went to the he went to the Art Institute of Chicago, and he came back having seen a lot of Matisse, mm -hmm. and he actually worked on this with Mrs. Hall. Oh wow! Uh, they uh, painted together. This is a study, but you see how much like Matisse it appears. Very much so. And I, I think uh, a fun piece. But she started thinking about design, and she said she'd never really studied design formally, and so this she did on her own. This is called Rhines, and I think it's one of our great, great works. Yes. And it combines something that we all have enjoyed in Mississippi a lot, which is watermelon, but with this marvelous sense of play of where the chairs are and the flattening of objects and the use of color, now bright, sharp, primary, mm -hmm. extraordinary. Here, she was fascinated uh, by water and spent time on the coast and this very detailed work of you know, the fishing pier uh, shows again the play of design. She's, she, this is a, still a transitional work. She's figuring things out. Same thing here with the duck. She's using design again. Uh, she's got uh, a bit of the pointillism with very large uh, uh, dots of paint, but it, it's it's a lovely work that just is playful. It's hard not to smile when you see this. You know, here again, uh, this, this is uh, uh, it's on wood. On wood. I think it's actually an earlier work, uh, but this is from that period. Mm -hmm. uh, the macro where she's flattened out things and uh, a, a lovely still life. Now, back, back to the sense of uh, the coast and loving water. Yeah. The, 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 she did a series based on sails, the sense of the uh, sail itself, the sense of the wind. And here in Night Sail, it's a study in color, obviously, and I, I think uh, very compelling with this shot of red in, in the center, uh, playing with blocks of color now. Uh, it's, uh, again, a continuation here, sails coming in. And she came back to works. She, she may have done this 
earlier and come back to it, you see the, how it's painted over. Mm -hmm. and this was uh, a common thing for her in the period. Now her signature is very bold. Yes. And She's very confident at that that's, point. That's correct. But before we go there, I, I, I'll show you again. She's still, she's still playing around with abstracts. Uh, and so here she's, she's has seen Picasso. This is, and she, this is a marvelous still life, actually. And another, it's called Mississippi Woods. She gave things titles, I think, to make them a little appealing. Another study. And then we come back, and she's definitely now breaking into abstract painting. Here she's influenced by Japanese calligraphy and uh, Chinese calligraphy, and she loves uh, the ink wash and, and to let things play on their own. This is a marvelous piece from the 60s. Uh, extraordinary. With the, the, this is the piece that Robert Storr, who's currently dean of the Yale School of Art, saw. I don't think he had known Mrs. Hall at the time. And froze it from this, this is a wonderful painting. And that emboldened me to write the book. Can you, can I you was going to ask. What, what, can, can you come yeah. and see if I yeah. show you the, the wonderful impasto of the uh, paint? It's a really bold work, 1964. And remember, she would have been 74, 74 at the time. Yes, yeah, so she was definitely not set in her ways. No. And this is Snow Hill. This is a terrific work that, uh, that she did on paper. Near Red Sunset. And now we, we start to get towards the end of her, her work. Here again, you can see uh, her uh, the the interest in Chinese yeah. calligraphy. It's, it's marvelous uh, that she, she actually ordered books uh, with the calligraphy. And then just, th these are not necessarily letters, of course, but that she just imposed you know, the, the gestures uh, onto her abstract works at the time. And now we're, we're coming into, you know, more complete abstract work. She calls it yellow fog, but I think you know, really color studies and uh, quite successful and beautiful. Uh, this certainly reminds me very much of uh, certain Milton Avery mm -hmm. works. But uh, this was the stables at Stafford Springs, and this is where they had an art colony. And uh, this is one of her very, very great works uh, from that period. And uh, 76 years old. It's 76, and it combines this bold sense of color uh, with complete control of the mm -hmm. architecture of the painting. Uh, and all right, now she's playing around. Uh, this is here, she's just. Really, it's a study uh, with her strokes, uh, but it, it, it shows her practicing in a way. And that would find you know, life in a work like this in Sedgefields, which I think, can you see this work? Uh, yeah, uh, wonderful. And it's, it's also a landscape. She, she kept coming back to landscapes. And in her later life, that sense of the landscape and the land of Mississippi would predominate. That's beautiful. This, this yeah. is a really extraordinary uh, painting, uh, bold and uh, I think uh, daring. Here, a little bit earlier than uh, two years earlier, yeah. this Sunset Pines. And, uh, you know, she's using, uh, the, it, could, it could almost be uh, flowers up close that we'll see with Tangle of Lilies. I, this is a, a, a marvelous and subtle work. And then in 1967, she had a, uh, this is a breakthrough painting. It's best to see almost from back here. If you look here, this is the blue landscape. 
And she strips away any sense of object. And it's really a study of color and uh, the banding, no doubt, came from Rothko. And it's considered a very influential work uh, because this banding we will see then to the end of her life. And I, it, if you get up close, uh, it looks uh, very uh, subtle uh, from a distance. It has a lot going on. It sure does. And the vertical stroke that she certainly is known for uh, it, it can be seen uh, very rich in color uh, and also very confident painting. Uh, wonderful work. And then this is green landscape, and she again now she's playing again with uh, these uh, elements. Uh, it, she has the high horizon even with the sun, uh, but part of this started with this work, this series uh, called Ruins, and this was the very first one. Mm -hmm. And she scratched out on a label. She, uh, the word landscape, she, it was called landscape with ruins, and then she scratched it out and left ruins. And Patty Carr Black thinks that this may have been inspired by uh, Windsor, by Windsor yeah. which is also known as ruins. And uh, it, it is a pretty uh, gutsy work. Again, she's 77 years yeah. old, and it's this huge canvas with this explosion of color. And when you, when you go far back, you see e even more of what's in there. And and also the banding is there that was in Blue Landscape. So it's an important work. Uh, this is in 69, that uh, also takes place. Uh, the, the banding, uh, it's called Distant Ruins. And, and she's deconstructing the elements and letting things play out in a little more, uh, in a freer way, I think. Uh, this is Tangle of Lilies. This work is uh, tour de force. Uh, it, it, it's, in a way, it uh, could be a still life, but it could be a forest. I mean, it's a uh, fantastic play of color uh, and structure. And I think if you come close, again, her use of color is uh, staggering. She, she said, uh, I love any color as long as it's pink. And she did love pink, and so there you have uh, a real example of a study. And one more sense of her love of pink is over here. Yes. This is the great pink lady. And the pink lady actually is Ida Colmar, the marvelous painter from New Orleans. And Mrs. Colmar and Mrs. Hall were great friends, and they were at an art colony together and the model didn't show up, and there were other students there, so Mrs. Hall said, Ida, you're just gonna have to model for us, and here I have a pink moo, moo for you to wear, and you put this on and sit for us. And so she did, and um, Mrs. Hall drew this and painted this of uh, Ida Comar and called it the Pink Lady, and I think it's very much a piece of its time. It feels yeah. very 60s. Oh, very and, definitely. You know, the, the crazy color and mixture of it, it it's a delightful piece. And here another piece of the time from 65, which is uh, called Flower Girl, and this has toured all over the world. But even though these are simpler brushstrokes, it's a little bit simpler way it's done than the earlier portraits, you still capture who she is. Oh, yeah. I mean, she still has that gift. That she, of course, yeah. oh, completely. Yeah. She, she could. I mean, uh, she's got everything. it down to where she could do it in two or three strokes. I think that's right. Yeah. To, which, just a gesture. Which shows brilliance, to be honest with uh, you. Of course, of course. Then. In 69, this is the same period, uh, she paints the, this, the great bright fields, yes. and every element is coming together here. Sense of the landscape, but also the sense of freedom, uh, sense of what she was striving for in her abstract works. The, the strokes that you saw at the bottom of ruins in the earlier painting from 67, she uses that here but then manages to blend all of the blocks of color together. So it has the banding, 
but somehow she breaks the bands too, so that it's yeah. not that formal structure right. isn't just strangulating uh, the painting. When you made the quote saying that she sees color like I hear music, this yes. is this is where that, that would come the, from. The, this is I was thinking of this painting in particular. Yeah. Of, the, of that this this painting really sings. It, yeah. it, it, it everything works in it. And why the exhibition is named after? It. And it is why the yeah. exhibition. I thought. As I thought of bright fields, too, I thought obviously of fields of color, but also of the land. Uh, we so much in Mississippi have all of us been influenced one way or the other by the land here, uh, and so it seemed to be an appropriate title. And then in the very same year, she began, she painted this of the Delta Sunset. This is where I'm from, the Delta, and took away in the very same year all of the elements that she had been painting uh, with the brush strokes and started to just distill this sense of color. And it, it's a powerful piece, but just because of its uh, seemingly uh, uh, simplicity. But of course, it's not simple at all. Uh, and it, it's really a powerful uh, work psychologically. To me, it's motivating, and as an artist, it's motivating to remember that how old she was when she was doing these pieces, but the fact that as artists, you and I need to continue to take risks. That's right. Even up until the very That's end. That's right. And she, not get stuck in one style. Uh, and she was seeing what was going on in yeah. the rest of the world, and, and that was influencing her, but uh, yeah. it, she made it very much her own. Yeah. This is also then the same year, and she's got the bands of color that you saw in Delta Sunset, but now she's letting the color bleed a little bit, and she's starting to put these small strokes and finally, in her last work, she did a triptych in 1972. Mississippi River, Mississippi Red Clay, and Mississippi Spring. It won uh, a large award for her and prestigious prize. But the real thing is that she painted this triptych, uh, and she was 82 at the time. Very important series. and. William Haney asked her, but what are these small strokes now that you're doing? And she said, uh, that's the lyrical. And, and the bands of color that she painted first, she said, that's the abstract, but this, this is the lyrical. And so she came back just at the end and did the, her, her trademark vertical strokes, but in fascinating ways and how she put them sometimes uh, in between the lines, uh, a, a unifying structure. And in a way, again, with the high horizon, uh, it unifies her entire body of work, I think. Uh, these, these works are landscapes, and yet they're abstracts. And they're tributes to her homeland that she loved so much. I think uh, three of her very greatest works. And they're together. And the fact that they're here together is remarkable. Uh, that one family did own all three, but they had been in different parts of the country, and they came back for this exhibit, and we're so grateful. And thank you for letting me show you this exhibit. Thank you for the tour. Thank you very much, Marshall. Thanks, Marcia. Chris. I appreciate Wonderful it. Wonderful to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all will come and see the exhibit. Uh, it will be on until January 10th here at the Mississippi Museum of Art, and then it goes to the Octa Museum in New Orleans. Very good.